Hello and welcome to CNBC Africa's special broadcast of the Afri Exim Bank's 25th Annual Meetings High Level Panel Session. The session, moderated by CNBC Africa's Brown Nelson, features Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Uganda, Luis Katsende, CEO Thelo Holdings, Ronin Tuli, former CEO BNI, Victor Silue, and Anil Dua, a partner at Gateway Partners, as they evaluate the response of trade finance institutions to Africa's current challenges and how such institutions adapt to new pressures and threats, such as rising protectionism and nationalism. interactive panel discussion. I will be cognizant of any hands that go up in the room and you can do that at any stage throughout our discussion this morning. I want to start with Dr. Orama's comment that $120 billion in terms of the finance gap, the trade finance gap that we are sitting with at the moment. And then we're going to touch on the trade infrastructure gap sitting at $93 billion. Not uh, a light conversation for this morning, gentlemen. And uh, I'm going to ask you, Governor, if you can start in terms of finance solutions. Because, yes, we're here celebrating 25 years of AF, Exim Bank, and a lot has been done. But as already stipulated, a lot more needs to be done. We need innovative risk mitigation finance solutions in the trade financing arena, and we need to close that gap as quickly as possible, Governor, in order to accelerate economic development and inclusive growth. Let's get your thoughts. Uh, but when we look at uh, um, the saving rates across Africa, one definitely sees that our savings rates are between 15 20 percent so there is a financing gap and i think we can all i mean this has been said over the last a huge years. financing gap a huge at 120 gap. billion dollars on an annual basis yes but i think we need to go beyond just gap feeling and looked at in terms of money because i mean look at uh, the period after 2008 Definitely, international banks withdraw. And we've now seen a recovery. But we don't see financing recovering. The question is why. There are other issues that have come into play. De-risking is now a reality. And institutions like the African Export Import Bank need to respond to those other emerging issues if Africa is going to finance, uh, finance uh, trade. I'll give you um, some examples. Governor, uh, I'm going to ask you for one example. Just, just one example. And then I'm going to uh, jump to Anil, who's going to come into yes. this conversation. On, whenever you look at the numbers, one of the biggest challenges now we face is not even Basel III. It is the anti-money laundering legislation that has been put in place, that trade financing is not only on the basis of papers. You now, now need to go beyond the papers and look at who is your other counterparty. So I'm such a strong supporter of the portal which has been set up by Afri Exim Bank, so that at the prick of a button, even the SMEs can know that the, this is the counterparty that I'm going to deal with. We want to chat about SMEs later in the discussion because this is a huge part of the problem in Africa. And if we want to fast track the growth in intra-Africa trade, we need to address the SMEs. But we're still staying with finance. Uh, Anil, let's get your thoughts. And of course, we're looking for solutions now to closing the trade finance gap. We've done a great job. AFRIXM done a fantastic situation in the past, but we've got to look forward. We've got to see what is coming and what do we need to do. I think we could do this in four ways. One is about capacity building, because we all understand there's a huge gap. The percentage of intra-Africa trade is very low. All the numbers speak for themselves, low finance rates, low savings rate, all of that. So the question is, how do we build capacity? And can AFRIXM alone do it, or it will require a collective effort by both multilateral organizations, private sector organizations, and government agencies. So I think that's the first thing. So, so that, Neil, can we answer that question? Because don't we know that it needs to be collaborative action of correct. all characters involved? Absolutely. So Afri, somebody has to take the lead, and I think AFRIXM is well poised to take the lead. Whether it's a 120 billion gap or a 500 billion gap, it will only come to know as the overall capacity of financing for trade increases in Africa. So that's the first point. 
The second point I'd also like to say is efficiency. At the moment, trade is a very inefficient way, especially in Africa, whether you're changing currencies, whether you are exchanging documentary evidence, it's terrible and it takes A, long time, and B, it's very expensive. So we need to develop an application, which sitting here, we should be able to trade between Burundi and Ghana at a press of a button. So that, I think, is the future, is to simplify and make the trading mechanism cheaper and more efficient. The, so that's the second point I want to talk about. The third, I think, aspiration that we should have is also about risk mitigation, which is trade is all about increasing confidence level between two service providers or two partners who want to do trade and haven't done it in the past, and you need an intermediary to be able to facilitate that. The ideal solution is for that intermediary to eventually disappear so that there is a so-called open account trade between both parties, which will then make the whole process even more efficient. So risk mitigation targeted towards basically getting confidence building between the two sides, I think, is important. And the last thing I would say, which is very important for AFRIX and bank and for trade, is facilitation. And here I would divide it in two aspects. One is facilitation by way of introductions. And we have some great examples of taking Northern, North Africa-based large companies in the power sector who were not familiar with the opportunities in Sub-Sahara Africa, and they have done extreme wonders. But that is the role that institutions like AFRIXIM can play, opening doors and arranging introductions. But then there is the last part, which is there is no point in producing quality goods in Zambia if you can't ship it to Angola. So you need infrastructure. We to need be able the infrastructure, which comes back Thank to you. the trade infrastructure gap of Correct. 93 billion dollars. Uh, Victor, you nodded furiously when Anil spoke about uh, risk mitigation. Now we know with trade finance, we're talking about relatively short-term finance. I think on average about six months because it can turn around and obviously you can liquidate goods if you need to in terms of mitigating some of that risk. But let's get your thoughts still on the finance arena in terms of fast-tracking risk mitigation solutions when it comes to uh, leveraging trade finance across the African continent. I can only fully agree with what Anil said. Uh, let's uh, keep in mind that uh, originally when we started African Bank, uh, the biggest problem that we had was the doubt. Can the African manage such an institution? Credibility was uh, key. And uh, we can say that uh, looking at the progress, by the time uh, the President Eduardo finished his mandate, if my recollection is good, we were about 500 million dollars uh, balance sheet size. By the time, 10 years after, Mr. Ekra finished his mandate, we were at $5 billion size. And uh, with starting with uh, President Orama, I think uh, we are on the verge of uh, the vicinity of uh, $15 billion now. So that shows you there's a consistency, and it means that uh, in order to get this consensus, consistency, you have to have methodology. You have to have standards. And this is what uh, basically the bank has done over the years, putting standards, standardizing their presentation, their risk evaluation, and the automation, because you cannot have an automation if you don't have standard, standardized methods. And that has been done. In the same token also, in terms of uh, uh, reacting with uh, our customers, uh, like the banks on the financial side, we have what we call the local administrative agents. They have to also to come on stream to be formed because the bank as it is, uh, you can see we have only a few branches. So we do rely on a local administrative agent to carry on the documentation, the follow through of the transaction. It is on this basis of all this improvement that efficiency has been brought. And this is why we, over the years, we've been able to have the result that we have. Having said that, the more we have uh, legitimacy, the more we can prove, uh, taking into account all the credits, the risk evaluation, and so forth, 
we can have credibility to raise more capital. And this is how we have been able to be more effective in producing uh, financing for the trading. And uh, I think also uh, this has been shown on the market in terms of uh, uh, raising capital. Uh, the rate, uh, the cost of raising this fund has been going down, which the bank has been able to pass on to its clients as well. So in a nutshell, this is how we've been able to, to progress in this field. Ronnie, let's fast track on the finance. Final question on the finance side in terms of closing the trade finance gap, and then we're going to move to, to infrastructure and knowledge. Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Bronwyn. I, I, I think we, how we ask the question uh, gives us direction on an answer, right? So, Are you objecting to my question here? Sir? No, 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 no. I will answer your question directly. Oh, thank you. The, the, the financing question, I think we have to... We have to consider is that effect or is that cause, right? I think capital follows opportunity. Uh, and I think our friends in bank has recognized that. I think as long as we don't have productive capacity, as long as we don't have the infrastructure to distribute the product that we make, it's gonna be, we're gonna be net importers of processed goods. And I think this is what Afrexim's uh, current strategy recognizes. Impact 2021 recognizes that we have to create productive capacity on the continent in order to be able to support intra-Africa trade in order to attract more capital at a more viable cost. So let me add to that. Yeah. Uh, industrialization. Correct. Beneficiation. Correct. Just another way of saying what you're saying right now. Correct. We need to fast track those elements in terms of productivity. Yeah, so I don't think it's a choice that we have. Uh, like I was saying earlier, as long, no matter how much capital we have for, for trade, if we don't have productive capacity, we're going to be net importers. All we will do is grow our importing, uh, the number of imports. What we have to do, and again I repeat, this is what the strategy of the bank recognizes now, is that even as a trade finance bank, what we have to do is we have to create capacity human, we have to create capacity um, productive, we have to create capacity infrastructure in order to move, to tick that number up in terms of intra african trade. Well, let's talk about beneficiation, industrialization, and certainly the Vision 2020 for Africa and Bank. Governor, if you can bring us and fast track the solutions from a human capacity perspective, from a beneficiation and from an industrialization. Again, talking to what Ronnie has said, it's very much about getting all of the characters that play on the stage to work together in order to fast track skills development and industrialization. Yes, uh, when you look at our history, we were initially designed mainly to export uh, uh, raw materials. And uh, if, even the infrastructure that we developed at that time was mainly to uh, integrate Africa as an exporter of uh, raw materials. We've had 50 years of, more than 50 years of independence. We need to focus on uh, value addition in our own countries and the things that Ronnie has just talked about are things that we need to do. We now have some very good examples in Botswana that are in that direction. And developing infrastructure that promotes intra-African trade will help us with that value addition. We have some very good examples now in East Africa where we have developed infrastructure and we have been able to develop industrialization based on that infrastructure supplying regional markets. Exactly, and regional market infrastructure development is crucial. So how are we going to fast track development of that regional infrastructure? And you talk about East Africa leading the charge. How are we going to get the rest of the continent to, to follow suit? And let's not forget the continental free trade area that is at play and I think is a game changer for Africa and certainly for everyone in this room. 44 signatories at this point to the continental free trade area and no so cfta cfta is a huge development i think the opportunity for africa to come together 
This is probably the single most change that has happened or the single biggest change that has happened to create a 55 country continent with free movement eventually and massaging free movement of goods and services to be able to play to a common theme. So this has huge, huge possibilities, but it will require a lot of political will to, this is the start, so it's a great start, but it will require a huge amount of political will by the governments, especially some of the senior government figures and senior governments that I call purely by way of size, that they will need to come into play and take the lead. And thereafter, then, it needs to then expand, not just into regional blocks, but into one pan-Africa solution. So I think that should be the objective, and that will require big effort. I think we should get President Obasanjo to speak about this. Now, you and I are on the same page, because President Obasanjo, I'm going to ask you, sir, to comment at this point. Being ever so passionate about intra-Africa trade, extra-Africa trade, and the political will, as Anil has already alluded to, do you feel, sir, that the political will is there to really cement Africa's trade arena? Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. I wasn't expecting that you would call me. <laughs> so my case is like the case of the uh, head of a church who wasn't expecting that he would be called for prayers. And when he was called for prayers, he said, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. But I will do better than that. <laughs> now, I, I, I want to go a little bit back to what the chair and the president of uh, Africa presented in his uh, uh, opening remark this morning. And um, to say that right from the beginning, our leaders appreciated one thing, that political independence must go hand in hand with our economic strength and our economic muscle. And um, that, that was the reason why within months of OAU coming into existence, uh, Africa Development Bank also came into existence. In fact, it's a space of about three or four months between them. And that has been the way it has uh, been since then. That the, our political development has to go hand in hand with our economic development. Now, our leaders appreciated that, and they did, I would say, almost everything to move us forward. But one of the things I believe that we did not understand early enough is that the world in which we are in is not a world that is really sympathetic to us. And we have to get what we have to get out of the world by dint of hard labor, by really getting it right that we are the architect of our own fortune. Now, I believe we are getting there. We are getting there when we listen to what the uh, chairman and the president of Africa Bank had to say this morning. We are getting there when we look at what the uh, African Development Bank is doing. We are getting there when we look at what even the regional banks, development banks, are doing. I believe that the issue is that we are, that there's money out there, internally and externally. We have to mobilize 
what the resources internally. And we have to invite, incentivize the resources externally for our trade, for our development, and for our progress. But if we get it all right, which we are now doing, we will get there. Thank you very much, President Obazanjo, former president of Nigeria, and valuable comments there about political development having to move with economic development. I'm going to stay with this theme, Governor. Do you see the political will? Are we moving quickly enough? <laughs> I'm not very good at politics, but I'll try. <laughs> now, I, I, the, on a number of occasions, uh, I've been critical of politicians, and sometimes I've said that they move slowly. But there, we've got some cases recently where I see coalitions of the willing, like in East Africa, where we are now implementing a single gauge layer for, from Mombasa. It has now reached uh, Nairobi. It is a regional project that will uh, connect Uganda, uh, Kenya, and, uh, and, and Rwanda. And we are going to see more of those projects uh, in, uh, in the region. And I think the, it is the objective behind it. It is that structural transformation of Africa and connecting markets. And uh, I think uh, they may be moving slowly and we may be frustrated by the speed, but I think they are we are focused on some few good things. Victor, you want to come in here? I think we're yeah. definitely seeing progress. So having hosted these conversations for 10 years plus, I'm really feeling excited about the momentum that is gathering at this point. Are you too, sir? Yes, I think uh, we're making progress. But uh, instead of uh, relying mostly on political will only, we have to also give confidence to market forces. As we set uh, the, 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 the pace to be able to make uh, infrastructure which are beneficial cross-border across countries, for instance, I will give you the example is railway. And I think that Rene will be in agreement with me on this. Uh, a, a railway that linking several countries is good, but it would be even better to make market forces work together if we were to raise long-term fund long-term capital on the regional exchanges involving several countries as well. This so will make this, our capital markets. Yes, and, and this is something that uh, uh, basically we can uh, expect uh, African Bank to be uh, involved in, to be able to, in, in the case, for instance, in West Africa, we have, uh, you know, countries linked like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Niger, but uh, since independence, it was supposed to have a railway connecting all these countries. Uh, effectively, uh, it went to, I think, Bobo Dulasso or something like this from Abidjan. But that was done during the colonial period and under the forced labor. But ever since it was stopped, not a single railway has been added to go to, up to Niamey. So I'm simply saying that this is the type of project that can really involve several countries across and have long-term impact as well. If just, you know, on the regional basis, we go beyond this link and we go to other countries as well. And uh, I think Africin Bank uh, has been uh, traditionally now been involved in more, uh, being more creating, reacting to the market needs. Yeah. And if you look at it, we went through, you know, and this is the point where, for instance, you mentioned that uh, the trade financing was to be short term. Yes, indeed. And we've been even challenged by the bank as well, management. Because initially, we were going to five years, uh, we went to seven years, and now even the seven years tenor, we are being challenged by market forces again, the, the, what is coming out of the market, requesting for long term tenor. So these are the things that we cannot ignore. And uh, I think uh, if you look at, for instance, on tourism aspect, we put a facility which is a contour, construction, uh, tourism facility linked. This has, and for us, it was a little bit challenged because they said, but we are going into hotel building. But that's not straight. But management turned around and said, no, but by having facilities, then business can be you know, enhanced by that and so forth. And this is how we So listen to that. market forces in terms of changing up the solutions provided. 
let's talk about the railway, Ronnie, for, for a moment, and the connectivity that is needed. And again, remembering that infrastructure projects, large infrastructure projects, are easy to monitor in terms of their progress. Victor makes an important point, and I think it's, it's not necessarily the way you, sum, you, you summarize it, because he wasn't talking about capital markets. I think the big, the big Dubai proposition, for example, if you think about it, uh, it was really, it, it was servicing market demand. You create the demand and you build the infrastructure to service the demand. That ensures sustainability. So I think the, the point that Victor makes is that rather than a political railway line from A to B without freight demand, what you will have is a white elephant. But I did summarize by saying listen to the market and provide the solutions that the market is requiring. Are you disputing that? I withdraw. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. But there, there is also the element of depth and breadth of capital markets to fund Absolutely. our own projects so that we insulate Absolutely. ourselves from yeah. currency volatility. Yeah. So, so we, are, we are, as a continent, we're in a very precarious position because, you see, and the role that our Afrexim Bank can play and the role that African Development Bank, and I think President Obasanjo was talking about this, and the regional sort of development banks can play, is that capital requires credibility. So the role that we can play institutionally is to arbitrage African risk. Right? We understand the continent, capital seeks the continent but doesn't comprehend the, the continent. What we can start doing is shaping the Africa opportunity, which is, has huge pent-up demand, huge. If you look at the population growth on our continent, it's either a big opportunity or a big th uh, threat. So it's a big, big, big opportunity. What we have to do is shape the Africa opportunity in a way that global capital comprehends. We have so to de-risk. So we that, have that we become, so we can then become that trusted conduit through which capital engages with the And continent. to add to that, Ronnie, I think sometimes we underestimate the fact that we're competing with other Absolutely. markets for that capital. And firmly, I want to put on the table that capital flows where capital is welcome. People want to be able to invest their money, they want to make a return, and they want to be able to get their money out of the environment easily and without any trouble. So unless so just, just we compete on that. And, and I think, and again, just to repeat the Afrexim story, and this is uh, the genius of uh, President Adordu, President Ekra, and President Barama uh, through their leadership, is that because we can uh, have this institutional credibility at a continent-wide level, and because we are a conduit to capital to uh, local financial institutions, what we also do then is raise the credibility of those domestic financial institutions who understand even better than we do the domestic market because they are present on the ground. You have been watching the Afri Exim Bank's high-level panel session, one of the week-long activities and meetings marking the 25th anniversary of the Africa Export Import Bank. More to come after the break. Welcome back. You're watching CNBC Africa's special broadcast of the Afri Exim Bank's 25th annual meeting's high-level panel session. In the second half, the panel discussion moves from trade, infrastructure financing and capital flows to the risking investments, fast-tracking capital flows to SMEs, among others. Have a look. You look as though you want to add there, sir. Well, uh... On the point of, uh, of uh, de risking, I think it goes back to the point that I had raised earlier that uh, for the participation of companies, especially at the SME, we need to look beyond, uh, beyond uh, just provision of capital, that we need innovative solutions that deal, at least help these small companies participate in the global trading environment. I think you have absolutely brilliantly leveraged to the next point of our discussion, and that is the neglected SME environment when it comes to trade finance. Uh, certainly, Dr. Arama made the point that 
trade finance is concentrated. There are a number of big players that dominate the space, and yet we know that drivers of economic growth, of inclusive economic growth on the African continent, lie in the SME environment. Uh, Anil, can I get everybody to comment on how we can fast track finance solutions for SMEs who don't have collateral, who don't have lengthy histories for, for banks to uh, research and give the rubber stamp to? So I think there are two aspects to this. One is that the so-called SME sector can also be further divided into actually there is a very buoyant, unorganized sector, so to speak. The you know, whole of Africa thrives on the ability of small individuals to be able to facilitate the sale and purchase of goods either in the local market or in neighboring villages. So there is actually a very huge so-called unorganized sector which is thriving in, on the continent. The second thing is as far as SMEs are concerned, it is not an easy one because the, tr the credit history or the track record of SMEs being able to successfully borrow and repay has always been a challenge, not just in Africa, but across uh, the space or across the world. So the countries which have done exceptionally well in the SME sector, Germany, Taiwan, all of them have essentially allowed their SME sectors to grow to a bigger scale because you can't keep an SME at an SME level because that will invariably result in lack of capacity, lack of capital, and it's kind of a vicious downward spiral. So I think the fact, the, the, what we, the environment we have to create is to allow the successful SMEs to grow and the less, which, the ones SMEs which are not doing well to perish. So that is the only way that banks can facilitate a thriving SME sector. A relatively cutthroat approach, but point taken, sir. Victor, and I'm going to be opening to the audience, so please let me know if there are any questions, so I'll come to you in a second. Can we stay with SMEs, Victor, in terms of uh, solutions? Uh, I guess with SMEs, uh, as Anil said, difficulties uh, lies with the risk. And uh, for the bank as it is, uh, yes, we can mobilize resources, uh, we can mobilize uh, what we do in euro and uh, used to be in dollars, by the way. And uh, because of the FX risk that was going and applied to both SMEs or even financial institutions, I think a plea was made to the bank to start raising also uh, capital in euro. And that's hereby for uh, African countries in the CFA zone, the FX risk was somehow mitigated because their currency is pegged to the euro. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the overall situation for SMEs, uh, it's important to, to know that also the bank, based on its structure, we do not have branches. There. Therefore, as I mentioned initially, we rely on local administrative agents. And therefore, it's important that you know, the awareness and the training they be able to fulfill you know, the duties. Because SMEs, you have to follow through, you have to assist, and, and that's part of the, the challenges that we have. And, but the other thing also, in terms of the funding, uh, given the nature of the business, it is how somehow uh, something that we do expect from African Bank to come more strongly, is to be able to raise uh, I would say local currency, local currency in the local market, as opposed to simply raising U.S. dollars. That because some of the needs of the SMEs are locally Which is the point denominated. that we made earlier in terms of improving depth and breadth of local capital markets yes. from a funding perspective. Sir, uh, question: Could we get a mic, please, to the front here? Thank you uh, very much. Uh, my name is uh, Hani Sumbul. I am the chief executive officer of the International Islamic. Trade Finance uh, Cooperation. I'm very honored to be among all of these distinguished really gathering this morning. On the issue of the gap, trade finance gap, I think one of the points that has been mentioned today is actually the, we need more collaborations among the MDBs and other players. And a good example is that now we have this very distinguished cooperation with Africa Exim Bank really to extend, really help and assistance in enhancing intra YC trade. Uh, intra of African trade. So we have a very important uh, really 
point to make here is that we need also in this collaborations not to be an, an ad hoc basis. It should be based on very special programs and initiatives, like the one now we are working also with Africa Exim Bank on what is called the Arab Africa Trade Bridge, where we are devoting all the resources for that. Going back again on a very important point, which is actually the SMEs. SMEs really needs a lot of attention. And as I said, to drive to that point, I wanted really to stress on a very important point uh, that is the, not only the financing gap, because financing is not alone, but the technological gap. Today we have the FinTech problems, solutions. We have now blockchain solutions that we can assist really uh, the SMEs uh, in addition to the traditional products that we are providing through line of financing and others. So I think Africa should really catch up. The technological gap is going to be really serious, but also in the same time is going to be a solution, solution for the trade finance that can be, can be uh, really so. So I think this is my, my interventions. I, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your observations, sir. And certainly the technology gap. Could we move the microphone to the back of the room, uh, the lady there? Thank you very much. So that spoke to what Anil said earlier in terms of the applications that can fast track, technological applications that can fast track trade between different countries. And I want to add to that as well, sorry ma'am, is also the knowledge gap that technology can help to close. So that's something we also need to bring into the conversation, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Simone Andre from Andre Project Finance and Better Eco. I'm very delighted to be here as a special guest from Dr. Rama. I think new ideas needs to be bring up on the stage, very innovative ideas. Um, for example, in order to combine not only the capacity building, but also to combine how to finance the production, the deepening the value chain, at the same time to strengthen inner trade of Africa. My background is I come from the investment banking. I worked for Siemens Financial Services to advise ministries. I know exactly where the risk is located and where the, links, the missing links are also to the SMEs. So I'm highly delighted to bring my expertise here to support you. Innovative ideas needs innovation and visionaries to share this, and then I'm really delighted to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a hand up directly there at the back. I'm not ignoring this side of the room, sir. You are next. Thank you very much. And then you, sir. Uh, good morning, uh, distinguished panelists. My name is Otuya Okecha, and um, I'm an ICT consultant. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, interregional cooperation. Um, one way to boost trade, I, I know, is to develop communications infrastructure. Um, the best way, I think, is to invest more in spreading broadband inf uh, infrastructure across Africa. Are there plans for, for, for these? And uh, that, that's just what I want to ask. Thank you. Uh, commentary from this side of the room. Thank you very much, sir. Mike is on its way. Can we move a mic to this side of the room, please? Thank you. To the gentleman at the back there. Right, so we're building on technology as being a key driver, key transformative driver when it comes to trade finance institutions being true agents of change in Africa. If you'd like to go ahead, sir. My name is um, Isaac Ogogo um, from Adventure Global. Um, a lot has been said here in respect to MSME and um, the need for Afroexim to develop the productive base of most African countries so that inter-African trade will not just be in a promotion of just goods and services. But one thing that we think um, I would suggest or ask Afroexim is what are they doing with respect to it? the development of the manpower, the skill development of their local administrative agent in such a way that they can be able to package their product to suit and manage the MSMEs. Thank you. I'll take one more from the audience. In fact, I'll take two more from the audience and then I'm going to move to concluding comments. Mm -hmm. What I am expecting, gentlemen, please be paying attention to the questions that are being asked from the floor. Because as we come to concluding comments, you're going to draw out those elements that you deem to be so important or most important that the audience has brought to the fore and give us insight into a partial meeting of the governors 
of uh, the Board of Governors of uh, Exxon Bank. Thank you very much. I've got there, sir. Thank you. Your Excellencies, uh, my name is Kevin YB, and I work with uh, SMSs and the grassroots state level. Uh, I just have a few questions, or one, rather. Yeah, just they keep first, it to one, please. One, yes. Yeah. Um, we talked about capacity building for MSMEs, but I want to know if the bank has an execution plan, because we've seen a lot of uh, programs talking about capacity building, but what about the execution plan? And who is monitoring the execution plan? So are we saying in the, uh, from now to 2020, are we going to uplift 2,000 SMEs in Africa, for example? And who is monitoring that? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if I could take a final question from the middle of the room, the gentleman in the blue hat, please. Could you deploy the mic? Thank you. Right, as I get a mic to the gentleman who's standing up in the room, I want you to think very carefully about your closing comments. SMEs, SMNEs, a burning issue in this room, gentlemen. So you cannot ignore it, and I want part of your closing comments to focus very much on execution of the plan set out, uh, as was pointed out by the gentleman a moment ago. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Ayede Jibalogun. I work for FX Commodities Exchange. Consid understanding that agriculture employs 70% of the labor force on the continent, constitutes about 40% of economic activity, but gets only between 2 to 5% of credit to the private sector. What is the role of commodities exchanges in the regional trade um, in Africa? How do we bring this to the fore? Because agricultural trade is a significant chunk of trade within Africa, but also with Africa and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. On that point, I'm going to move to closing comments. Anil, you have the uh, chance of going first, sir, remembering technology in terms of closing knowledge gap, infrastructure, financing, SMEs. Let's not forget agriculture, which is the underpin of the African continent. There's a lot for you to address, sir. Okay, let me start with agriculture since that was the last question. I think you're absolutely right. Commodity exchanges are very much needed. They need to bring uniformity of prices and consistency of prices to farmers across the continent. So to have the linked commodity indexes or exchanges is extremely important. And I think that's another role that institutions like AfriXM can play in facilitating exchanges with, in, in different parts of the continent. In terms of the other factors that I've said, I continue to maintain that one of the big thrusts that needs to happen is technology and applications. And what I, the kind of aspiration in my mind that I think as AfriXM can do is not just based on an application, facilitate seamless transactions at very low cost on both currency as well as on documents, but equally allow other participants to risk participate in these transactions by looking at selecting those which they like and those that they don't like, so that we can build a common platform with different agencies in being able to build capacity for trade finance. I think that application or that kind of application will go a long way, and there's enough technology available to be able to do that. In terms of SMEs, I know that's a big focus because it leads to essentially large employment. You cannot do, uh, you cannot have industrialization or employment generation without SMEs. And I think where again we are focused or where AfriXM is focused is on providing a certain percentage of its capital and to the SME sector and equally to the sectors which facilitate foreign currency earnings, so i.e. the export development uh, phase. So these are entities which earn foreign currency, which is, as you know, an acute shortage in most of the countries. So that is the, the stated ambition of AfriXM Bank. The last point I'd say is about infrastructure. You're absolutely, the, the gap is huge, but also the pace of change that is happening within organizations and within companies within Africa is also equally changing with a very rapid pace. And what is very enlightening is that you're not needing to rely on everything to the government sector, but actually the private sector is going and moving into places where five years or 10 years before 
you would not have thought that they would do so. So I'm no, very thank you. hugely optimistic on the future of Africa. The groundwork very well laid for concluding comments and we're building as we move through the line. Victor, you're up next. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to say on agriculture that uh, this is a key issue because uh, all across all Africa, uh, financial institutions are prone to finance uh, the goods while they are in warehouse, where they are on the way of being exported. That's easier. But the production itself is lagging way behind. And the reason is clear also, this is where you have the, the bulk of the risk. And uh, therefore, uh, I think it, this needs to be addressed. But how? Uh, if, for instance, to, to be able to address this, there's a need to put technology in place, uh, research in place, and make them work together. And this is where, for instance, uh, we can see that uh, in terms of the productivity, we are way behind. Productivity in Africa in agriculture is low. And then when we go to the point where we should not really uh, not take that into consideration in terms of the transformation, the value added. But you do transformation and value added on the production in terms of quality sometimes, in terms of qu quantity also, which is not there. You may have your plant, but if you don't have the proper prime raw material inside, you cannot also have a finished prime product. So this is a ma major issue that needs to be addressed. And maybe uh, a way also to come alongside to try to address that issue is indeed the commodity uh, stock exchange. Uh, we have the, you know, the, commodity, the stock exchange for the paper, the materialized one, but in terms of the commodity in all the other countries uh, which went be, 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 uh, ahead of us in Europe, they, they, they started with the commodity exchange, physical one, and then they moved to the materialized exchange. But in our case, at this stage, you know, it's hard to find that, uh, you know, a commodity exchange. And I think this is one of the challenges that, uh, that lay in front of uh, Afrexim Bank. Uh, among all the big pillars that we ask the, the bank to, to do in terms of its strategy, to my recollection, there's on the only, one, only one which is remaining not fulfilled. It is a commodity stock exchange. So Victor, hopefully you. that will be tackled on. And uh, in terms of also what we want to project ourselves in terms of uh, long-term mobilization of long-term resources, domestic market is important as well because uh, it applies to some, for instance, I can give you an example in terms of mining sector. You need heavy equipment, you need uh, some work, you need, to, but some of uh, the work involved in the contracts are local content. And they can be financed with long-term capital as well, but domestic capital, so that they're not subjected to any exchange risk. And this is also a role that we can play in trying to be constructive in what we are doing. But uh, if, if I, may, I may want to finish with this, if you look at the presentation of the president, it touched on so many products that was done. That was based on innovation. And innovation responding to market demand. You know, if you take, for instance, the central bank deposit funds uh, that we have, if you take uh, the private equity fund that is now, this is responding to market demand. And uh, this is where, as long as a bank position itself as a problem solver, you can imagine that uh, there's no situation where we have no work to do. And this is where that increases the relevance of the institution for Africa. Let's take it, Ronnie, uh, in terms of increasing the relevance of the institution, Africa and Bank for Africa. Very well put, sir. Thank you very much, Ronnie. So, uh, again, you see, we have to, we have to look at it as, at a macroeconomic uh, level. Uh, the question of SMMEs, technology, agriculture, because we have, we have uh, many of our countries have a very fast growing population. Um, we need to provide solutions that will deliver sustainable livelihood for, for African people, right? You, we are entering a, an era where technology is disrupting 
what is job creation, the, the methodology of job creation as we know it today, which is industry. Uh, technology is disrupting long-standing industries. So, and again, the point that Victor makes is, we as Afrexim Bank have to continuously position ourselves in a manner that answers questions for Africa, for African problems. So we have to think what is the balance between job decimating technology versus job creating old type industry, for example, and deploy capital into that. Because no matter how much effort we make to navigate ourselves to uh, efficient technology and applications and things like that, whilst we're not creating jobs, we, we are increasing the risk for the continent. So there's no doubt that when we set out the mandate for this discussion, it was about improving economic development yeah. and achieving inclusive growth across the African continent by fast-tracking trade, both intra and extra Africa trade. On that note, sir, could you give us final comments? My, my, my final comment is that uh, um, it won't be Afriexim. I don't think we should just look out to the rollout of a strategy of Afriexim alone. For SMEs, as Anil said earlier, this is a very promising but complicated segment of, the, of our economy. It will take different partnerships, as different people have said, but it will also take a government plan to address the challenges faced by uh, SMEs. So let us not only look to Afriexim. Afriexim will play its role. It will be able to leverage on the capacities within Afriexim to provide us with the solutions, even uh, solutions that are associated with the technology. But we need to go beyond that. Organizations within countries, the policies of individual governments is what will help us galvanize this SMP sector to contribute to the structural transformation of our countries. And I think on that note, if we conclude the comment on two words, collaboration, Africa. Three words, collaboration, Africa, trade. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us, Governor Ronnie, Victor, Anil. It's been a pleasure. You have just watched the high-level panel session on trade finance institutions as agents of change in Africa, a part of the week-long activities marking the 25th anniversary and annual meetings of the Africa in Bank. Thank you for watching. I am Christy Cole from the team and I. Goodbye.